folks, it's Dr. Gilchrist here, and we are finally done with our discussion of hearing, and now we're going to move on to some of our other different bodily senses. So we're going to start with a discussion about the vestibular system. And as we're going to see, one of the things that's kind of nice about the vestibular system is that it makes use of very similar structures to what we saw for hearing and a lot of the same properties. So um, I want to kind of start with a discussion that your book talks about. And once again, I find that um, that a lot of the things that I liked to do when I was a kid that I think made me a little bit of a weird kid also really helped me understand uh, sensation and perception a little bit better. Um, so your book kind of puts it to you this way. Remember when you were a child and you used to spin around until you were dizzy and couldn't walk straight? Perhaps you even fell. Why were you dizzy? And so I know I did that as a kid. Odds are pretty good. You might have done that uh, at some point as a kid, or maybe you spun around in a spinning chair or something like that. And you probably had that sense uh, once you were done doing that of being a little bit off balance, being a little bit off kilter, and maybe wondering a little bit why that happened. And part of the reason that that happens is because of the vestibular system. So here's what we're going to be talking about for this week's lecture. We're going to talk about the overall purpose of our vestibular sense, the vestibular organ and its different components, which are located right around the cochlea of the ear, perceiving different aspects of spatial orientation. Now, vestibular senses are they work the way they do because they integrate information with our other senses. And so we're going to talk about this integration of information as well as active sensing. And then we'll talk about what happens when our vestibular sense goes wrong. So we're going to start by talking about the purpose of the vestibular system. So our vestibular sense is largely conveyed by our vestibular organs. I'm gonna spend more time talking about the uh, components of these later on, but I wanna start with something very simple. Um, the vestibular organ is about the size of a pea, not a pea in its pod, but an actual pea that comes from a pod, located right near the cochlea. It is a vestibular labyrinth, or sometimes referred to as a bony labyrinth, with five different organs. So we have three different semicircular canals, which are responsible for rotational motion. And then we have two otolith organs, the utricle and the saccule. One of these conveys information about gravity and the other contains information about linear acceleration. Now, what's really critical with our vestibular sense, figuring out how we're oriented in space, is that like a lot of our other sensory systems, our sensory systems are looking for change. So what's really critical with our vestibular sense is that we're looking for changes in velocity, changes in rotation. In particular, we're looking for uh, acceleration, so a change in momentum, or we're looking at a deceleration. One of the things we're gonna find is that if you're moving at a constant velocity, the vestibular organ does not code for that. It's looking for changes. So constant velocity will not lead to a vestibular signal. We're looking for acceleration or deceleration. So how do the vestibular organs help us? And I know certainly for me, um, I can tell that my vestibular organs help me um, when, when they're not working so well. I can appreciate when they work by noticing instances in which they don't work. So this is typically a time of year where allergies are pretty common. That's not even getting into COVID-19, of course. Um, but I tend to find, especially when the seasons change, I'm a little more prone to allergies, congestion, and sinus infections. And so 
I can tell in particular when I'm having a really bad day, like a day where I'm really congested, when I wake up in the morning, I get out of bed, and I can barely walk straight. I am so congested um, because of the connections between the ears, the nose, and the throat that my sense of orientation is off. And maybe that's happened to you as well. So I can appreciate when things work under circumstances when they don't work. That helps me have gratitude for my sense of balance under normal circumstances. So our vestibular organs really provide us uh, a sense of spatial orientation. And there are a couple of different unique modalities associated with our sense of spatial orientation. That will include linear motion, angular motion, and tilt. So linear motion tends to happen if we are moving in a vehicle and then suddenly um, somebody slams on the brakes. So that's a case where we have linear motion, we've got a sudden deceleration and you can feel your body uh, as that car stops continue to move forward. Uh, angular motion, like you might experience on a roller coaster or a tilt-a-whirl and then tilt which you can experience when you nod your head up and down. And by the way, during these lectures, you might occasionally hear me to say to kind of nod your head. If your family or your friends walk by and they look at you kind of weird, tell them Dr. Gilchrist told you to. So that way they can think I'm weird instead of thinking that you're weird. So here's kind of an example that your book gives. So one of the ways that we can see that a sense of spatial orientation is useful is with something like the vestibulo-ocular reflex, which we talked about a little bit uh, a couple of chapters ago. So I want you to try each of these uh, different tasks. So right here in task number A, um, what I kind or task letter A, not number A, task A, what I'd like you to do is stare at your finger and very rapidly move your finger back and forth while you keep your head stable. Now, in that sense, if you look at your finger, you probably notice that the finger is making a little bit of a blur. Now, I'd like you to hold your finger and I'd like you to shake your head back and forth as if you're telling me no. Try not to do it too quickly, but go back and forth, shake your head no at a constant speed and look at your finger. Odds are pretty good, it's not moving around. Your finger's not really getting that sense of moving around the way it did when you were shaking your finger back and forth. Now, likewise, pick up a book or look at some of the words in this lecture and shake your head back and forth. Now, you'll notice that there's a little bit of movement, but by and large, you can still read the words. And now take a minute because you've been shaking your head back and forth. I feel like my brain's just been in a blender. Um, but for B and C, what we're basically seeing is the vestibulo-ocular reflex in action. And the idea is your brain knows when you make a head movement. And when you make a head movement, you want to make sure that whatever you are seeing in that environment stays stable. So basically what you will do with the vestibulo-ocular reflex is the eyes are basically going to counter-rotate to compensate for the fact that your head's moving. And it's basically going to try to keep that image as stable as it can. So Having that sense of spatial orientation can be quite useful. You are moving through your environment in a variety of different ways, and you need as much as possible to keep your body stable, have a sense of equilibrium, have a sense of posture, and keep the world around you and, and what you perceive stable as well. So this helps us maintain our balance and stabilize our eyes during motion. So what sort of things will happen when our vestibular sense fails? What if you're like me and you're really, really congested, for example? Um, so you may experience what we call spatial disorientation. That's going to give you a sense that you are off balance, that you're out of that equilibrium. And there are usually two different types of spatial disorientation that we can experience. One of those is dizziness, where you just feel off balance. Vertigo is different. Vertigo is a sense that you are either rotating 
or spinning. And that has occasionally happened to me as well when I am super duper congested. You may have just a general sense of imbalance. You may have blurred vision. You may also have a case of illusory self-motion. One of the ways that you can kind of experience this a little bit is um, one way I certainly experience this. If I'm on the treadmill for a really long time and I've been running at a really fast speed, there's this brief little period when I turn off the treadmill and I almost feel like things are still moving around me. Another time that you might experience this is if you are driving in a car and you suddenly stop and you might get the sense that you're still moving or the cars around you are moving. So all of these are things that can happen when our sense fails. And they're often not very, very pleasant. And as we're going to see, there are specific disorders that can make um, living your life very, very debilitating. So our vestibular sense is a really important thing to have. So this is a case where the concept of active sensing comes into play. And with our vestibular sense, active sensing is key. So think about this uh, kind of as an example. So when we talk about the concept of active sensing, that means that you're actively trying to probe the environment in some sort of way. You're not just letting passive things come to you. So you might think about our senses to a lesser extent, like vision and hearing as more passive senses. Something in the environment makes a sound and our ears pick it up. We don't have to do anything to really get that sense. Likewise, um, if I want to see something, well, it's already out in the environment. I don't actively have to do anything to see it. That's very passive. On the other hand, vestibular senses are active senses. So another type of active sensing, that can include bats basically using their sonar sense to help find food sources. So they put that sonar out in the world and based on the feedback that they get, they will basically change uh, their directions. They will change where they're going to actually go find food. So our vestibular sense does require a very similar act of probing. We don't just passively do nothing. So one of the things that our vestibular sense takes into account is it does take into account what we call afferent signals versus efferent signals. Now, if you've had my uh, biopsychology class, you've probably heard me talk about afferent versus efferent. But our vestibular sense is a multi-sensory sort of thing. And so it needs information from our senses to our brain. So it needs things like our uh, we need things like um, our proprioceptors, which are in our muscles, and they help us understand things like joint position. That's kind of a somatosensory sense. So we use our somatosensory senses, we use our vision, we might even use our hearing, and send those afferent signals to the brain. So we use those other signals from our senses, like our muscles, our touch receptors, and so on. On the other hand, we also get efferent commands. That flows from our brain to our muscles to help engage in different types of movement. That's part of the reason why your eyes stabilize when you move your head around. And that's because a signal has been sent from your brain to the muscles in your neck and shoulders that your head is moving. Your vestibular sense is able to take that efferent command into account and say, oh, their head's moving, let's counter-rotate the eyes to have some stability. So this is really important. We don't, vest, our vestibular sense is really not a passive thing. We do get some afferent signals from the environment, but we also get signals from our body movements to help us navigate our world and maintain our balance and our posture. So spatial orientation. 
our sense of where we are in space is made up of three different sensory modalities. And you'll notice that I use the word modalities rather than qualities. And the reason that we call them modalities rather than qualities is that they use different sensory organs and different methods of energy. So we have angular motion. You can actually sense your angular motion when you rotate your head from side to side, such as when you shake your head no. We have linear motion, which is sensed when you suddenly accelerate or decelerate in a car. And then we have tilt. And this is sensed as orientation with respect to gravity. And you can experience tilt when you nod your head down and back up, or when you move your upper body down and back up. So when we talk about spatial orientation, and we're going to spend some time talking about spatial orientation, it's really helpful to think about the head in terms of different coordinates. We live in a three-dimensional world. We have to move around in a three-dimensional world. And as such, it's very, very helpful when we talk about our environment and our bodies and our heads as existing in three different uh, three different planes. So we have our x-axis, which you can think of as kind of running through the head. We have our y-axis, which is basically kind of running through our ears. So this is kind our y-axis is kind of like um, our x and y are basically kind of horizontal in nature, and then our z-axis is our vertical axis. Now, with respect to rotation, there are a couple of different types of rotation that you might hear me talk about. I'm not really going to test you on these very much, but if you hear me say yaw rotation, I want you to at least have some idea of what that means. So, when we talk about, we talk about three different rotation types based on these three axes. So, we have pitch, we have roll, and we have yaw. So roll happens on that x-axis that kind of cuts through the center of the head. That's when we rotate around the x-axis in this case. Um, when we have a pitch movement, that is rotation around the y-axis. So if you've ever... Um, if you've ever been on one of those circus rides, for example, where you go briefly upside down and you're going in that big, big loop, that's actually a pitch movement. And then a yaw movement would be rotation around that Z axis, around that vertical axis. So going on a merry-go-round, anything that rotates in a circle um, would be a case of a yaw rotation. So when we talked about some of our different senses, we talked about things like magnitude, we talked about things like amplitude, and we talked about things like direction. Now for our vestibular sense, we need to have a measure of amplitude, which is basically a metric of its intensity, and then we need to think about the direction that we're moving in. So how do we generally code for amplitude and for direction? So when we talk about amplitude for our vestibular sense, we are talking about, for example, the size, either an increase or a decrease of a head movement. So think about, for example, nodding your head very, very slowly and making a very, very tiny head movement. Go ahead and try to do that now. Now, I'd like you to shake your head quite a bit, nod that head up and down and try to make the movement really big. That is a change in amplitude. We started with a really small head nod, and then we basically increased the intensity of the movement. That is a change in amplitude. Direction is basically the line that you are moving along or facing. So I could be doing a movement, um, I could be doing a, uh, a movement straight forward in front of me, and then I could move left. That would indicate a change in direction. Or if I'm on a ride like the Gravitron, I could start with a roll movement, or actually that would be a yaw movement, and then suddenly it turns into a combination of both yaw and to a lesser extent, maybe pitch. Ah, I can't, I closed out. 
Well, I think this is about as good a time as any to go ahead and take a break here, and we will pick this up and talk about the otolith organs very, very